Hello, this is Dr. Amin Marashi, retina specialist in Marashi Eye Clinic in Adipo, Syria. I am presenting the course of OCT for macular diseases. In the previous presentations, I discussed the pathological and reflectivity changes in the retinal and choroidal tissues. In this presentation, I will discuss clinical applications of vitromacular interface abnormalities, including stages of posterior vitreous separation, vitromacular traction, and epiretinal membrane. When the posterior cortical vitreous separates from the posterior pole, it happens in stages. Like stage 1, there would still be a posterior cortical vitreous adhesion at the center of the fovea, while the posterior cortical vitreous is separated perifovially. However, this stage shouldn't be mistaken with vitromacular traction, as in vitromacular adhesion, there won't be disruption of an ellipsoid zone or inner retinal tissues, and it is asymptomatic. In contrast, in stage 2, the posterior cortical vitreous will detach from the fovea completely but still attached to the optic nerve. In stage 3, there is a complete separation of the vitreous even from the optic nerve. As in vitromacular adhesion, the vitromacular tractions shows the separation of the vitreous perifovially but with vitromacular attraction at the center of the fovea in the form of a plate and showing anterior posterior oblique posterior cortical vitreous traction with disruption of the ellipsoid zone, interdigitation zone, and inner retinal tissues. In more advanced cases of vitromacular traction or cases associated with diabetic maculopathy, there would be an increase of central macular thickness with or without hyporeflective cystic changes or and subretinal fluid. In advanced cases, a macular detachment may occur. OCT is a handy tool to measure vitromacular attachment as in cases that are less than 500 microns have a better chance of spontaneously releasing the vitromacular traction. In contrast, broad attachment of more than 1,500 microns have less chance to have a spontaneous release. Therefore, OCT is mandatory not only to diagnose and also for decision making in cases of vitromacular tractions. A pyrethral membrane appears as a hyperreflective pad which can be thin in silicon maculopathy or thick in advanced cases, lying over the retinal surface, which may induce corrugation of the inner retinal tissues forming pegs and hyporeflective pockets. The epiretinal membrane may cause increased retinal thickness and elevation of the foveal pit. It may induce folds of inner retinal tissue with or without intraretinal cystic formation or subretinal fluids. In cases, the epiretinal membrane is primary, the attachment will be broad, while in cases of secondary epiretinal membrane, the attachment will be multifocal. In cases, the epiretinal membrane is detached spontaneously, it will look like a scroll located next to the inner retinal surface. However, cases presented with both epiretinal membrane and vitromacular traction will have retinal features of both entities and sometimes splitting of the posterior cortical hyaloid is seen on OCT. Cases presented with epiretinal membrane and vitromacular traction have more chance of spontaneously releasing the epiretinal membrane than cases of epiretinal membrane presented without vitromacular traction. Epiretinal membrane and vitromacular traction can be associated with disruption of the ellipsoid zone or disorganization of inner retinal layers, which are poor visual prognostic factors post-surgery in severe cases. OCT is an essential tool to monitor the spontaneous release of the vitromacular traction and to assess the post-surgical success and normalization of the macular anatomy, which may take some time for anatomy to normalize. This is a case of vitromacular traction with diabetic macular edema, pre presented with 20-25 best corrected visual acuity, showing anterior-posterior 
oblique vitromacular traction with cystic formation and increased central macular thickness. However, the decision was to follow up the patient within six months a spontaneous release of vitro macular traction accord with improved both best corrected visual acuity to 2020 and central macular thickness with persistent macular cysts that needed no further intervention rather than observation. In contrast, this case of diabetic macular pathy is complicated with both toad vitromacular traction causing intraretinal cystic changes, macular detachment and increased central macular thickness, and a peritoneal membrane, which causing corrugation of inner retinal tissues. The best corrected visual acuity was counting fingers. This case was managed with parse plana vitrectomy with epiretinal membrane removal and ILM peeling. Within one month, an improvement of both foveal anatomy and central macular thickness was observed. However, a persistent cystic formation is observed with improved vision to 2040 only due to ellipsoid zone disruption. Within three months of follow-up, the majority of cysts resolved but with no improvement of visual acuity due to persistent ellipsoid zone disruption. In advanced cases of epiretinal membrane, a pseudo-hole may be formed, which appears as verticalization of the fovea and reshaping it in U or V shape with increased retinal thickness with overlying epiretinal membrane. One of the key features of the pseudo-hole is there is no lamellar defect in the outer retinal tissues. Usually, the ellipsoid zone and external limiting membrane are intact in cases of pseudo-hole. One of the ways to accurately diagnose a pseudo-hole is using NFAS OCT, where pseudo-hole will feature a circle surrounded with another smooth circle and radial folds will emanate, forming a sunflower pattern. Thank you for listening. I hope you find this information useful in your daily clinical practice. Please stay tuned for the next presentation where I will discuss clinical application of OCT in cases of macular hole and retinal detachment.